Welcome to the Triage Method Podcast with me, Gary McGowan, and my co-host, Mr. Patrick Farrell. How are you this week, Fatty? As per usual, I am positively fantastic, Gary. How are you? Very good. Lovely. So what are we talking about today? So we're going to be putting in the, the final installment, or at least for now, um, on cardiovascular health, essentially. So basically the last uh, number of episodes, somewhere between probably six and 10 at this point, depending on which ones you put in the series, um, have all been dedicated towards the cardiovascular system, how exercise in, impacts cardiovascular health, um, what blood pressure is, the different things that affect that, uh, what atherosclerosis is and how nutrition affects that. And in this uh, particular episode, basically what we want to do is do basically a big review to run over all the things that we have discussed and add in some additional details so that you, the end user of the information, can basically get an overview of the things you should be most concerned about when it comes to preserving cardiovascular health long term and the things that maybe don't matter quite as much or matter in more kind of niche cases, you know, Um, because I think the good thing about this topic is that while there are a lot of moving parts and obviously it's very complex to try to uh, tease out all the details of what affects your cardiovascular health, there are some things that really do move the needle. And if you do kind of uh, adhere to these practices long-term over the course of decades, you can significantly affect your cardiovascular disease risk, which is ultimately what we want. Yeah, so we basically have a list of things that we just want to touch on. Somewhat bullet point, go through some things. Some things need a little bit more explanation. Some things are just like, all right, this is, we've already discussed this in previous episodes, or this is pretty pretty easy to understand, doesn't need a huge amount of, you know, extra to go along with it. So this episode could be extremely quick, or it, it, it could be quite long, right? We don't know. We do know we have a few things we want to cover and we'll see how, how quickly we can get through them, right? So the first thing first, there's obviously a load of different things, you know, within this health, fitness, lifestyle stuff that you can do that just unquantifiably improves your health, you know, like stress management. Like I can't give you a specific number or a specific, a specific uh, amount that that's going to decrease your risk of heart disease, right? But it's still good practice to, you know, engage in stress management, you know? Same with getting uh, enough sleep, you know? Like, it's, it's good practice. So what I'm saying is all of the stuff that we're going to discuss around nutrition and, you know, exercise and lifestyle and stuff, like, this is all on the backbone of just general good health practices, you know, like this is, this, this is kind of more so the, the icing on the cake. You should already just be doing the, the good health practices as it is. You know, we've, we've discussed it in countless episodes, you know, how to structure your diet, how to structure your training, all that kind of stuff. So it's like, we're assuming there's some foundational stuff done there. Right. And this is more so like, Hmm, I'm actually just forward thinking a little bit and, you know, there is quite a bit of heart disease uh, in my family or, you know, I'm a little bit worried about it or, you know, I want to just ensure that that isn't what gets me, you know, um, you, you just, you just want to pay a little bit more attention to your diet, your health, your lifestyle, whatever, with the context of, you know, heart disease, right? So we're assuming there is some sort of healthful eating, healthful training practices, healthful lifestyle practices already in place, right? And that's the the assumption that we're going into with this. Because obviously, if you are just eating a terrible diet, not training, not sleeping, you know, stressing all the time, it's like, okay, well, they're the the big hitter things that you need to just look after the the baseline, get to like just the normal, we'll call it. And that's going to decrease your heart disease risk as is you know so basically what i'm saying is you need to engage in all the practices we've talked about previously um if you want to be in a good place right now with that caveat out of the way the first thing we just want to touch on and we've touched on it a few times before is your genetics right now we're talking about an episode of like practical things of what you can do um so why am i mentioning genetics and the reason i'm mentioning it is because I want to caveat this again by saying that you could do everything right and still get heart disease, right? Like it, it literally could just be in your genetics. You know, you could just have 
we'll call it unfortunate genetics for heart disease risk or heart disease full stop. And you could literally be so on top of everything we're going to discuss here. You know, even the stuff that you're like, mm, there's it's, there's controversy over this. Um, um, I'm, I'm not sure how much either side of this I should fall on or where I should fall. You know, you could follow all of the guidelines and still get heart disease. You know, you could be shredded out of your mind, 3% body fat, bodybuilder, triathlete, and fucking judokist, and be in peak health and still get heart disease. You know, so... If your genetics are, if it's in your genetics, it's in your genetics, right? So that is something that you then need to obviously discuss with your, your doctor. You know, there are pharmaceuticals that, pharmaceutical therapies that you may just need to be on. Like you might just need to be on statins for your whole life, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. Like there's nothing you can do about it, you know? And just ignoring that fact is, you know, just missing part of the story, you know? So Again, that's something that you need to discuss with your doctor. However, before you discuss it with your doctor, you know, you can just be like, right, I'm just going to try all the the healthful stuff. And then, you know, just get a blood panel done, you know, whenever I'm concerned about this, see where things are at, you know, because this is also what I wanted to say. uh, And that is, you know, the, the good thing about this stuff is there are measurable things that we can, you know, see how things are ticking along you know like if you go to your doctor just for your annual like physical your your checkup whatever and you're like all right i'm actually a little bit concerned about heart disease risk and um, there's heart disease in my in my family you know you can get a, a lipid panel you know um like I, you can also get other tests but like that's unless you're there's a reason for other testing i probably just wouldn't the lipid panel fairly handy to do um and it tells you uh, a bit anyway, right? So you can see where things are at, you know? And you can see where, you know, your LDL is. You can see where your HDL is. You can see, like, all the stuff that, you know, we discussed in the last episode and the episode before that, or, yeah, the episode before that. Um, you know, you can see where things are at. So, it, it like, it, there are measurable things, right? So, generally, we aren't one to suggest just testing for the sake of testing be like oh get these million different blood panels get these million different you know genetic tests and whatever else however if you are concerned about heart disease risk it's a fairly easy thing to do just once a year you know see where you're at okay you're in a a little bit of a bad level here or here or here it's like all right maybe then you want to get more frequent testing you know so you can see how what you're doing is changing things like maybe every I don't know, three, six months. Again, something you, you talk about your, with your doctor um, and see how the changes you make actually impact that. Um, but for the majority of people, like if you just get it done once a year, see where you're at, you're, you're pretty good to go. You know, um, assuming obviously everything is fairly on point. Would you agree with that, Gary? Yeah, like I think the, the genetics piece of the puzzle is something that's very easy to ignore and not touch, but is really, really important um, to consider because like you could have like FH, familial uh, hypercholesterolemia. And if, if you have, if you are homozygous or heterozygous uh, for, for that condition, like you could have, you have varying, basically it exists in some sort of spectrum where the severity of the increase in, in cholesterol or LDL is going to vary uh, depending on what type of presentation you have. But if you are one of those individuals, you know, um, nutrition just isn't going to cut it, you know, sorry, but like, that's, that's kind of the bias we end up having a lot of the time in the fitness industry. And I know that I have at baseline is that like, I want nutrition and exercise to be able to fix everything, you know? And when I look at a particular condition where exercise doesn't have much of an impact, I'm always like, ah, feck it. You know, I'm like, I'm disappointed because I like, I just want exercise to be a panacea. But I think when you're starting to think about your own health and the health of others and actual decision-making, you have to realize that there's, there's a limit, there's a threshold um, at which nutrition and exercise just aren't going to cut it anymore. So that's not to say that if you're an individual who has um, a genetic variation in um, the LDL receptor or PCSK9 or uh, NPC1L1, these are some of the common ones. There can be variations in those that could lead you to be someone who's uh, you get a gain in function or a gain in function mutation. You've got to be someone who basically 
clears cholesterol better. You could be on the good side of things and get away with worse nutrition potentially. Um, that's obviously like the win. That's what you want. Um, but that doesn't mean it won't catch up to bite you in other areas of your health. Um, you could be that person and nutrition might not even be something you need to pay that much attention to versus someone else who has um, the familial hypercholesterolemia. They have to pay a ridiculous amount of attention to not only their, their nutrition, but also their medication adherence. You know, So they have to be thinking about how is everything impacting uh, my cardiovascular health because if you're one of those individuals you could be dead by 40 with a heart attack um, and unfortunately a little extra fiber just doesn't quite cut it in those contexts so yeah do realize genetic does genetics does play a role and there's absolutely no shame in being someone who has has high cholesterol or high ldl um, with a healthy diet it's just a case of saying right that's fine you know i've done my best i'm going to keep doing what i can but ultimately medication does play a role here yeah 100 percent um, and again, like that's really important to do to, to understand that there is this spectrum. And again, there are obviously differences in our genetics. So like when you're looking at some other individual and you're like, well, they didn't get heart disease or they're recommending to eat this way. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's a healthful diet for you. You know, like you, you, you have to layer on your individuality. Like it's so funny because people always want to be an individual until you know, we actually start to try to individualize things and then they're like, Oh, but I want to eat like my friend or I want to uh, train like my friend. I'm like, I thought you wanted to be an individual, you know, <laughs> like, uh, so take that for what you will. Um, caveat our entire discussion now with the fact that you could be on either end of this spectrum. You could just literally do whatever the fuck you like and just basically be immune from fucking heart disease risk because your genetics are just extraordinarily favorable from this. And you could also be on the other end of the spectrum and, literally do every single thing right and still get heart disease you know so take from that what you will and caveat the entire discussion with that in mind right so with that in mind let's actually get into the discussion so the, the first thing and um, like obviously this is going to be a mix of training nutrition lifestyle stuff and um, but there's a lot of uh nutritional things that uh you yeah, know probably make uh somewhat of a difference and we want to just obviously go through them now these are in no particular order like i literally just wrote these down in, in off the top of my head like there is a little bit of an order to them but i don't want you to think that this is like magnitude of effect these are the things these are the top things you need to work on and then you know lower down effect there's there, there's no particular order to these <laughs> so the first one is just cholesterol intake because obviously people hear like oh my the cholesterol in my blood um you know, that this seems to play a role in heart disease and um, obviously cholesterol in the diet that, that, that seems to, you know, I, I would obviously want to, to manage that. And um, that seems pretty exp explanatory, you know, uh, or self-explanatory. Uh, if my blood cholesterol is high, then I obviously want to change my dietary cholesterol, right? However, it doesn't really work like that. Like cholesterol is, you know, managed in the body in this like homeostatic way. And um, so if you just eat less cholesterol, like your body will just make up the difference, right? Um, and same the opposite way. Obviously, if you eat more cholesterol, your body will just make less. Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't pay attention to your cholesterol intake at all, you know, because obviously your body can only make a certain amount. So if you eat way in above and beyond that, like you're eating like, I don't know, 50 grams of actual cholesterol per day, you know, like that's probably going to have some sort of effect, <laughs> you know? Um, but also we can't just, uh, you know, isolate nutrients. Like if I, like I'm saying cholesterol here, like you probably have in your head, like ideas about what are high cholesterol food purely from the perspective of like what's been exposed, you've been exposed to from the media and your friends, family or whatever. And, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean like you're, uh, what I mean is you're thinking in foods. You're not thinking in like, Oh, I just had cholesterol there. You know, you're thinking like, Oh, I had eggs, you know? Uh, for your cholesterol so we need to think in in the context of the food matrix rather ju than just in in context of actual cholesterol itself right so we do still need to be somewhat aware of cholesterol because that by virtue of just being aware of cholesterol that tends to positively uh positively associate with good nutrition and what i mean by that is you make better food choices with regard to other stuff if you are a little bit more aware of your your cholesterol intake you know, so this is one that I'm not too worried about. You know, uh, it's pretty hard 
if you're eating a healthful diet, like we generally recommend, or you follow the rest of the stuff we're going to touch on here to over consume cholesterol or to consume cholesterol in a manner that would be hazardous to your, your heart health. Um, but at the same time, I don't want people to just, it, it, the, the argument seems to get, you know, dichotomized where it's like, you need to be really aware of cholesterol or you need to just ignore it. It doesn't matter at all, whatever, forget about it. And I'm kind of like in the middle where I'm like, yeah, like we probably do need to just be aware of cholesterol because of the, the food matrix and the overall context of the diet. Um, but it's not something that I'm like, this individual is coming to me and they're eating, you know, this amount of cholesterol. Is this an issue? You know, I'm like, well, it depends on everything else. Do you have anything else to say on cholesterol, Gary? Yeah, I think, I think cholesterol is an inter interesting one because if you were to look purely, and this is what a lot of, a lot of research did do uh, early on, if you were to look purely at the relationship between cholesterol intake and cardiovascular disease, you would indeed kind of see that relationship where, oh, the people who have higher intakes of cholesterol do actually have a, a greater risk of cardiovascular disease. However, when you stratify that, basically break it down by saturated fat intake, it seems like saturated fat is, is a fairly a strong mediating factor there in that if you have uh, higher levels of cholesterol in the context of a uh, high saturated fat diet, which is often the case, um, that basically increases your risk further um, because basically what, what happens is with higher in, saturated fat intakes, um, you get lower um, expression of the LDL receptor. And if you don't have uh, the expression of the LDL receptor, you lower amount of receptors to take up um, the cholesterol. Then then what that means is that you've got higher levels of cholesterol then floating around in your blood on those lipoproteins like we discussed. Um, however, if you don't have that high saturated fat intake, then the normal homeostatic regulation that Patty's discussing is superior. Um, so basically, if you're following the rest of our guidelines, which is kind of what we are recommending and assuming that you do, if you follow everything else, cholesterol probably isn't something you need to be too concerned about. But if it's the case that you're like on a really high saturated fat diet, we're not saying that like that is a good situation to also be eating um, really high levels of cholesterol. So basically, with all this discussion, diet is complex and the uh, presence of one th presence or absence of one thing in the diet also affects um, everything else. Like for example, uh, cholesterol regulation is heavily dependent also on things like fiber intake. So if you're like the recommendation for cholesterol might also adjust if we were not if you're not following the fiber guidelines that we discussed. So basically, take the whole conversation into account and view it as a spectrum um, rather than just like a kind of good bad thinking. You know. Yeah, this is, the, again, the unfortunate, we've discussed it before, but it's the unfortunate thing about like most health and nutrition stuff. It's it's not a, a pick and choose menu. It's like, no, this is the set menu. You have to you have to do all of these things, you know? And um, obviously you can pick and choose, but depending on how you combine these things, some things are synergistic and some things only work with the other stuff if you did the other stuff, you know? So it's unfortunate about nutrition, especially because people like to, isolate in on different things and it's like you just can't right anyway the next one we probably can actually isolate in on because we've pretty good evidence for it uh trans fats um this is this is one that you know when they came out they, they seemed pretty pretty good like it was like this this makes sense you know we can store things we can you know from a consumer perspective it was like the trans fats seem pretty pretty g however from a, a heart disease perspective they they don't seem to be great at all right and i i always like to caveat this one is like i'm like generally we're, we're actually talking about man-made trans fats because there are trans fats in nature especially in something like milk you know and um, and they don't seem to be negative or perhaps the the overall food matrix makes up for any negative that's associated with these trans fats you know you're not you're not just only eating trans fats you know yeah and um, so again there's there's potential confounders there and whatever but i see no reason for the inclusion of trans fats in the diet you know like and i think most most uh businesses most uh government organizations most things are like yeah people generally don't seem to want trans fats there's a pretty good awareness that trans fats are negative for for health so we're not going to include them in our our products you know however they are still in some products um, or they are still in some products in a small quantity, which is, you know, not a big deal. Um, if you're only eating a small quantity of those foods, like say some baked goods, you know, however, if you're eating 
you know, some of those foods every single day or lots of those foods every single day, which can often be the case, you know, you can potentially be in a, a negative situation. However, in this day and age, like trans fats have kind of gone by the wayside and I'm not too worried about people consuming trans fats. It's not something that I'm like, we really need to, you know, dial in on your trans fatty acid intake um, because, you know, I'm a little bit worried about it. Like that's not somewhere I start with an individual, <laughs> you know, um, but just for completeness of this discussion, trans fats, they don't seem to be great for, for the old ticker. So uh, if, if possible, avoid. Yeah, would recommend avoiding. And to be honest, like even if, uh, even if they're not still in the food supply, it's still just wise not to consume excess quantities of the foods that they were contained in anyway. Like, you know, don't eat uh, loads and loads of muffins and biscuits and stuff, you know, I mean. Yeah, again, it's kind of it's, com common sense nutrition, really. Yeah, again, like this is what I'm saying. We were saying earlier on about like it's like you have to take the context of the diet, the whole food matrix into yeah. account. Like generally, if someone is eating, you know, 20 cookies per day, it's like well, like heart disease is probably the the least of your uh, your worries. You know, there's probably other things that are going to fall, like the wheels are going to fall off the wagon somewhere else before heart disease gets you. You know, and um, anyway, right. The next one is saturated fat and this is like it's controversial which is weird to say firstly it's weird to say about nutrition because realistically it's fucking nutrition like it's ju it's just food like it doesn't it, it's not it's not like politics it's not like economics it's not like any of those other things that you know potentially are more important than nutrition and all we're recommending is here's a potential way you could organize your diet you know it's not like you must do this i'm going to mandate this you know it's just like just nutrition we're just recommending a way to eat that potentially decreases your heart disease risk right however with that in mind like i'm of the opinion and maybe this is because i'm somewhat more libertarian even though i hate that uh rec that categorization um i'm like i don't care what the fuck you eat do whatever the fuck you want if you want to listen to the rest of this argument the entire discussion and go i'm actually just not going to follow their saturated fat guidelines I'm like that's cool you're fucking perfectly willing uh, or within your right to do that, right? However, for those that want the complete discussion, <laughs> saturated fat, uh, we've discussed it before. Obviously, Gary touched on it again in the last episode with Alan as well. Um, but generally, saturated fat doesn't seem to be overly beneficial for, for the old uh, heart health, right? However, that doesn't mean that it's not beneficial for health itself, right? So, again i hate these arguments where it's like either or you know it's like you must reduce it to a zero i'm like i don't think that's a good recommendation either you know again taking the food matrix into uh, account and like that tends to pretty limit the types of foods that you can eat you know um and you miss out on other vital nutrients as well as a result right however it's probably a good recommendation to just keep saturated fat below 10 percent of your calories, right? And again, a real quick and easy way to do this calculation is just pretend that fat has 10 calories, right? Like it has nine, but just pretend it has 10. So whatever calories you're on, like assuming you're tracking your calories and you're like, I'm on 2,500 calories, right? Again, assuming that fat has 10 calories, that means that you can have 25 grams of saturated fat, right, per day, which is actually quite a lot, you know? Like assuming, we'll say butter, is like 70% saturated fat, right? That means you can have like 40 grams of butter per day, you know, like obviously just in isolation, like you're obviously going to eat other things, you know, um, but like 10% is still a lot of calories is what I'm saying. You know, if you're on 3000 calories, if you're on 5000 calories, you can still get away with quite a lot of saturated fat intake, you know? And um, so I, I like, again, I don't like when people are like, yo, you need to bring it down to zero. It's like that's, there's no there's no evidence for that in my mind anyway that i've seen that's conclusive like zero percent is better than ten percent you know i'm like i'd be fairly confident in saying ten percent is better than twenty percent you know um but I, i'm of the opinion that i'm like you know ten percent is actually quite a lot you could like i don't see people eating like 200 grams of fat well most normal people anyway you know so i'm like it's fairly handy to just keep your saturated fat below ten percent now, you can also probably go up to like 15%, you know, like there's research that kind of 10 to 15 seems to be the, the good spot, you know, especially if you are 
doing all of the other things. Like if you're like, oh, I'm an absolute saturated fat fiend, like all the foods I like are high saturated fat foods. You know, I just enjoy eating these foods and like it really allows me to stick to my diet and whatever. I'm like, okay, well, let's see if we can get it down to the 15 mark and then pay way more attention to all the other stuff as well, you know? So we can somewhat uh, mediate any risk that there is between that 10 to 15 percent mark you know because again the diet is a uh, uh, an art or a science of compromise you know you like you make a win over here you might have to make a, a loss over here you know so what are your thoughts on on that gary would you agree would you disagree would you be more concerned if someone had you know higher intakes of saturated fat above 10 percent? are you a fan of lower what's the crack yeah, like, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the, the 10% threshold because realistically, I don't think that, I don't think that the vast majority of the population are ever going to micromanage their nutrition to the point where like they're actually counting and seeing is this 10% and is that all the time? So when I, when I see like rough kind of guidelines to say, all right, try and aim for less than 10%, I think that's a sound approach because it gives people something to aim at. It's likely that they're going to end up uh, above that sometimes, below that sometimes. I mean, like, you know, if you have, uh, I had a large pizza there the other night with like layered in pepperoni and everything, you know, if you were to count the saturated fat in that, you know, that could take up my intake for a couple of days. So, I mean, like that's a big spike in it. And then the next day might be a bit lower. So basically what you're looking at is that you want your long-term diet pattern to be close to this level. So I think the 10% threshold is a sound thing to aim at. But again, as we discussed with Alan last week, it is more complicated. And that's why having a simple recommendation is actually good because it gives you something to aim at without having to micromanage everything. Because like, as mentioned last week, there's a difference between uh, saturated fat from something like butter and something and saturated fat from uh, whole dairy. So whole yogurt, milk, uh, cheeses, for example, even things like dark chocolate, which also have you know, compounds that can be beneficial for cardiovascular health potentially. So like saturated fat is not saturated fat in that it totally depends on the rest of the food matrix as well. And hence, if someone was had a uh, 15 to 20% saturated fat, let's say, and well, there, there was two different individuals at that level, one person was getting all their saturated fat from uh, 25% uh, kind of fatty burgers that were cooked in butter. And that was like across the board, that's where they were getting most of their saturated fat. And the rest was coming from like uh, cookies and buns, etc. Whereas the other individual, you know, their overall diet is healthful and they happen to be getting a higher level of saturated fat because they really like yogurt <laughs> and milk and cheese, you know, um, in, in that individual, like I, there's a, clearly a difference in risk. There's going to be a difference in risk there. Um, so you need to consider the whole diet. But overall, I think the 10% target to aim at is pretty sound. But that doesn't mean that going lower and lower and lower is always going to be beneficial because effectively what you see in the research is that when there are studies, and this is why null findings sometimes pop up that say that, hey, saturated fat doesn't seem to be much of a risk factor. Basically, what they're looking at is looking at populations that have ridiculously low intakes um, of saturated fat already, much lower than you'd see in, in Ireland and the UK with our typical kind of dietary patterns. Um, so when you look at those individuals, like, yeah, you're not going to see much of a difference in risk because, again, people are saying, try to eat less than 10%, and that's pretty sound. So what we're really concerned about here is minimizing the amount of people that are getting up in the morning and having a full fry up that's cooked in butter, which is giving them saturated fat for three days, potentially, um, rather than saying, Hey, no milk, no cheese, no yogurt, you know? Um, so yeah, look, it's not, it's not a case of aiming for zero aim for less than 10%. And if you're getting on a, on average and taking care of everything else, I think you're doing the vast majority of what you can do from a nutrition perspective. Yeah. Like we said, at the start, context matters, you know, like yeah. it, it really, depends on the overall context of the diet pattern, the, the, the food choices, all of that stuff, you know? So like, again, 10% is a pretty handy fucking thing. I'm not too worried if it's a little bit higher. Maybe Gary's a little bit more worried than I am. But, uh, you know, as a general recommendation, if we're talking to just, you know, gen pop, I'd be like, just 10%. It's a fairly handy, you know, idea. You know, you probably do have to layer on some food knowledge you're like these are high saturated fat foods you can't just be like 10 percent because again people don't you know measure in macronutrients you know or even nutrients they measure in like foods you know they're like oh what foods are high in saturated fat so obviously again you have to layer on that context you have to talk to the individual in front of you and not just 
you know, a theoretical thing. I like this move that there is recently in terms of uh, moving away from discussions of isolated nutrients and moving more towards discussions of yeah. foods. Like, I think that's really helpful for, you know, the, the gen pop um, rather than what always happens in like, nutrition or health discussions we basically just fucking circle jerk each other off where it's like oh let's talk uh, uh, in this like academiaized way and not actually help individuals at the end of it all you know so we try not to do that you know obviously that's a little bit hard sometimes um next one anyway so obviously saturated fat is a big one but again as i said before we discussed it some people are like no i'm just not going to listen to that that's perfectly fine couldn't care less what you do with your life and um, Let's move on. <laughs> so the next one is monounsaturated fat. This one, again, I'll probably be fairly confident that just get the majority of your fats from monounsaturated fats and you'll have beneficial effects from that. You know, like there's some worries over polyunsaturated fat, which we'll, we'll come to in a second. Um, but there are barely any worries over monounsaturated fat. So if you're like, oh, I don't know who to believe or whatever, you're fairly I can be fairly confident in saying that monounsaturated fats, you've hedged your bets. They're fairly inert. They seem to have potentially positive effects on uh, HDL. Now, as Gary and Alan discussed uh, in the previous one, that's not necessarily always, you know, the, this, you know, massive increase. Like you can't just massively increase your HDL and be like, oh, look, the ratio is all good. And, you know, it doesn't matter about the, the, the quantity uh, in the blood or anything. It's like there's, it's a little bit more nuanced than that. So just saying that, oh, I increased my HDL because I took some monounsaturated fats like olive oil or something, you know, um, that's not necessarily the entire discussion or the entire um, argument or whatever, you know. Um, however, I'd be fairly confident if you were like, you showed me your diet and I looked at it and I was like, yeah, look, this is, you're choosing mainly monounsaturated fats. There's a little bit of saturated fat in there. It's below 10%. Happy days, you know. Any other things to say on monounsaturated fat, Gary? Yeah. So like, you know, you were saying that um, people generally don't have concerns about monounsaturated fat, but I think if you go to the opposite end of the spectrum, you actually do see these concerns. Like they're much like you have the kind of low carb keto crowd who try to totally um, say, deny that, you know, that there's any problem with consuming very high amounts of saturated fat, you know, and they'll kind of regress that argument eventually to the point of saying, hey, you know, our understanding of heart disease is actually wrong, you know, which is a great way of getting out of defending your nutrition discussion. Um, but the, on the other side of the spectrum, you have the same thing in, in some uh, corners of the vegan community. So in some corners of the vegan community, you have people who genuinely think that um, eating or consuming olive oil and stuff is really bad for heart health, which like you'd have to do a lot of mental gymnastics to look at the research and say that olive oil and avocados and monounsaturated fat, et cetera, um, is, is a problem uh, for cardiovascular health. Uh, I think some of this does come from uh, previous research where when you, if you look at monounsaturated fat and you're just looking at the composition of the diet and see who has monounsaturated fat, sometimes you can be basically just picking that up because it's coming from animal foods, because a lot of the time monounsaturated fat is coming from animal foods and not just uh, plant-based foods. And when you do strata, stratify risk um, in studies that have kind of looked at monounsaturated monounsaturated fat intake in, in, anim, in animal foods versus plant foods, you do see lower cardiovascular risk or risk when it's coming from uh, plant foods. And I think it's important to put that into context because that means that people are consciously eating things like nuts, avocados, olive oil, etc. cetera. Um, whereas if you're looking at monounsaturated fat that's high in the context of animal foods, you could be picking up individuals who just happen to eat lots of beef, beef and butter. And that's, you know, that's coming up uh, in, in that context. So, so yeah, it is still a case of remembering that uh, foods are composites. So, you know, when we say monounsaturated fat foods, there's still going to be a composition of fatty acids within those foods. Um, and hence, if you look into some research, especially if it's not kind of controlling for other fatty acids and stuff, um, it can be a bit more complicated to, to see what the truth really is. Uh, but in general, yeah, I completely agree with you. I think like, there's like, there's, there's nothing but good really to come from um, adding avocado or olive oil um, or nuts to your diet. So, so yeah, get, get those monounsaturated fats in. Yeah, they're pretty good. And this is also like, again, you have to always take the food matrix into account because again, people always like to say like, oh, this food is a high in saturated fat food. Like if I said beef tallow, right? Like if I was suggesting someone use beef tallow for, which is basically like, you know, rendered fat from beef, you know? Um, 
which would be similar. What's the one for pork? What's that called? Um, can't remember. Anyway, anyway, beef tallow, right? So if I was to say that, people would automatically be like, all right, that's obviously high saturated fat food, right? However, there is technically more monounsaturated fat in that fat, right? There's, it's like 51 to 49, right? So technically speaking, it's like, all right, well, like, this is a monounsaturated, high monounsaturated fat food, right? But people would, because it's an animal fat and because it's literally just like rendered fat from uh, beef, they'd be like, oh, it's high saturated fat food, right? So what, what I'm saying is it's pretty much a 50-50 split. So you could just be like, yeah, like this is a high saturated fat food or yeah, this is a high monounsaturated fat food. And this is, this is obviously an issue when we're discussing nutrition because he, like, how do you classify that food then? How do you categorize that? Um, because we're not, like most people aren't looking at isolated nutrients. They're not going like, oh, this is monounsaturated fat. You know, they're like, this is beef tallow. You know, like it has fats, you know, that's, that's all I, that's all I'm thinking about, you know? So what I'm saying is it's very hard to isolate nutrients within food and the only think of it in that context. And like Gary said, like you can have people that are anti monounsaturated fat because of stuff like this, because again, it's like, oh, well, they, they have a high monounsaturated fat intake, but they also have it in the context of a higher saturated fat intake and also a higher animal product intake, you know? Um, so again, there's there's confounders there's people that like to make uh, complaints about everything but anyway uh, <laughs> i'd be fairly confident in saying that monounsaturated at worst is inert you know at best yeah. has positive effects you know so if you're literally so unsure about how you should fucking portion out your fatty acids and you're like i don't know if I, these saturated fat people these anti-saturated fat or pro-saturated fat people are correct or the next one we're going to get onto is polyunsaturated and these pro or anti polyunsaturated fats. People are, you know, I don't know who to believe. You know, I'd be fairly confident in just sticking to higher monounsaturated fat intake and you know, you're, you've hedged your bets, right? Um, the next one then polyunsaturated fat. Um, these obviously do in include the essential fatty acids. So these are an, an important, class of fatty acids however your essential fatty acid intake is actually relatively low and easy to get if you are eating any kind of healthful diet now you may be getting more omega-6 to than omega-3 like the omega-3s are a little bit harder to to get um unless you're actually like trying to get them like you're trying to eat some fish or you know um you can get flax and stuff, um, which, you know, it doesn't really convert as well as we would ideally like. Um, but there is also like krill and algae oils and stuff like that. So you can get the, regardless of your diet pattern, if you're vegan, vegetarian, plant-based fucking carnivore, like wherever you fall on it, you know, it, you can with a little bit of work, get your essential fatty acids, right? And a great thing about essential fatty acids is, you know, the great thing about fats in general is they are stored, right? So, you know, you can eat more one day and not have to worry about it. You know, like it's not like you have to eat them every single day. It's not like you have to eat fish every single day or else, you know, you're not going to have enough essential fatty acids, right? So you can eat some on fucking Monday and Thursday, you can be like, they're the two days that I eat higher intakes of, you know, the essential fatty acids. And I get enough that it covers me for the rest of the week. Right. So that's kind of good about the, the polyunsaturated fats or rather the uh, omega threes and omega sixes. And um, however, there is some controversy over omega six intake and heart disease and omega three intake and heart disease. And people like to be like, Oh, uh, omega six is inflammatory. And Omega-3 is, you know, anti-inflammatory. And that's just not the way human physiology works. And I always like to do this, like to, to remind people that arachidonic acid is one of the key signaling mediators in muscle building. Um, and arachidonic acid is an omega-6 and is touted as being pro-inflammatory, right? So you over there can definitely go over and be like, I'm never eating an omega-6 again. I'm like, cool, I'm not going to build any muscle. Um, that can, you're perfectly within your right to do that, right? So anyway, look, we're not going to get into the discussion of omega-6s versus omega-3s because like, it's not a discussion in my mind. I'm like, this, it's just, it's stupid. 
Um, it's just not, yeah. yeah like it's and like, there, there actually is, to, to support your point, there actually is research um, supporting higher le- or supporting omega-6, uh, uh, helping hypertrophy. So I don't know if you remember this. You're probably just a little bit too young for this, but they used to sell arachidonic acid. As, yeah, I know. I do remember that, yeah. You know, like, so... Anyway, look, it's irrelevant. There are there are concerns. Now, I'm not saying that the, the, all the concerns are just stupid or whatever. There are concerns to having a completely skewed omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. You know, that does seem to be, uh, or certain ratios seem to be more healthful than others. You know, if you're literally, your intake is 3,000 omega-6 to 1 omega-3, you know, that's probably not healthful like there's people that are like it should be one to one i'm like it's probably a little bit unrealistic in most diet patterns across human history even and you know what i would be aiming for a a more even split like i like kind of a a four to one or a ten to one uh, ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 but again this is like very like micromanaging your diet and it's not something that i'm like like just eat some fish twice three times per week you're pretty good to go, you know, and maybe don't have a huge amount of like industrial seed oils or something. Um, and you won't get extraordinarily high intakes of omega sixes and you're good to go. You know, like that's like, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be too hard. I, it's not something that I would be overly concerned about it unless you have to be overly concerned about it. You know, you know, obviously we're talking about heart disease. So maybe you are overly concerned about it, in which case, you know, you probably, want to eat a little bit more uh, omega-3s. They do seem to have anti-inflammatory properties and pretty good all around. You know, maybe you do want to lower your omega-6 intake. That'd be pretty good as well for some people, right? If you were an inflammatory state and you're like, oh, these are maybe potentially, you know, inflammatory uh, promoting, I'm like, okay, cool. Like you can reduce them. Maybe you might see some positive effects. That's not something that I would be like, this is my first port of call, you know? However, right, getting back to just polyunsaturated fats overall, these are pretty beneficial. They're a panacea of health. Like, again, we were just discussing before the podcast, you know, if you displace um, saturated fat or even in some circumstances, monounsaturated fat and replace it with polyunsaturated fat, you seem to get positive health outcomes, right? Yep. So I'm like, yeah, have some polyunsaturated fat in your diet, you know? Like I've, I've actually got articles written on our site about fat intake and everything. So if you want to read more in depth into it, get a lot of references, etc. Like they're they're on our site. You know, you can you can read them. You know, um, but pretty good, pretty beneficial to get some polyunsaturated fat in your diet. Now, would I be like, right, 100% of your fat intake should be polyunsaturated fat? Mm, no, probably not. That's probably not how I would set things up. You know, um, but having a a decent amount of polyunsaturated fat seems to be beneficial, right? Now, the I probably wouldn't recommend cooking with it, but that's me. I'm a, a biochemist, so maybe that's my uh, my uh, bias coming through. I'm like, oh, well, like I don't like the oxidization or these fucking uh, products that are made uh, from the heating process. Um, however, it, I don't think it's a huge like the magnitude of effect is is not huge. I probably wouldn't go out of my way to buy some sort of polyunsaturated fat as a cooking oil, you know, but I have no problem saying, you know, add some sort of polyunsaturated fat to your meals. You know, I would probably just cook with a monounsaturated fat or potentially even a saturated fat, you know, but that's my bias. And you have to, you have to uh, layer on your own bias. Maybe you're just like, I actually just don't think it's a, a huge issue cooking with polyunsaturated fat. Like, I actually don't think it's a huge issue. Um, but I'm like, I just don't see the reason why you would go out of your way to cook with a polyunsaturated fat. You know, do you have any thoughts on that, Gary? Yeah. Um, like, I mean, cooking oil is one, is one of those things where like you, you have to weigh up one, the smoke in your kitchen <laughs> two the flavor, the flavor, which is pretty significant. And three, obviously the, the health effects. So, I mean, like, uh, for, for me, like when I look at the, the kind of typical, uh, oils that people would cook with, like, I would agree with you. It seems like, you know, cooking with monounsaturated, uh, fatty acid d- dominant oils are, are the way people typically think of them. So like olive oil, for example, that, they tend to be quite healthful and they tend to be frequently used and 
tasty depending on your taste preferences um so yeah i would uh, I, I would generally agree um the only the only thing i would the only thing i would say is that like going back to the kind of omega-6 omega-3 d- discussion just to to kind of support support your point more or less um i think it's just one of those things where like you re- there, it's a ratio that's kind of made out to be uh, really scientifically useful that just doesn't really have much hard evidence to support it and basically like what you're probably looking at there realistically if you do find evidence to support um oh look it, it looks like those with a, a lower intake of omega-6 um or, or lower ratio rather um you're basically probably looking looking at someone there who maybe doesn't consume as much omega-6s from baked goods and things like that you know because someone could have um a very high ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 and that could be solely because they're getting a lot of uh sunflower oil based products um baked products that are low in omega-3s and as a result they have uh, and a heightened level of omega-6s um, but it's not really the result of them actually uh, making conscious choices to consume things like like walnuts or flaxseed oil or other types of healthful oils or fish or whatever. Um, so basically, I think a lot of the things that you, you do see emerge from the body of research in general on fatty acids are things that reflect diet patterns. And I think if you just focus on uh, a good quality diet that is containing things like fish and olive oil and nuts and seeds, etc., the fatty acid composition is just going to take care of itself and you don't need to sweat it too much thereafter. Um, so yeah, br- bringing it back to the food, the food based stuff. That's the only reason I bring that back because, you know, I don't want people getting caught up in ratios and specific numbers and everything when realistically just focusing on basic food choices, maintaining that over the long term is going to give you the vast majority of what you actually need here. You know, hundred percent Gary. Right. Now the next one, I'll let you talk about it because I've just been chatting shit for a while. Carbohydrates, carbohydrates and heart disease. Where should we be at? Yeah. So like carbohydrates and heart disease, um, again, an area of uh, some degree of controversy, because if you go to some areas of the interwebs, again, the kind of low carb, low carb, high fat keto side of the internet, you know, they'll start to say that, you know, it's all just carbohydrates, you know, that's the sole problem. It's all just carbohydrates. And that's not actually totally uh, absent of truth in that there, there there's an element of can, can like does your carbohydrate choices affect your cardiovascular disease risk for sure um but they, that kind of works in both directions so if you're eating a diet that is very high in uh processed junk foods you know and really high in calories really high in carbohydrates really high in fat you know i'm never going to argue that that's a good diet pattern like it's just not a good idea um, however to turn around and say that it's the carbs is just a really uh, poor way of looking at things because in general when you look at the types of foods that people consume when they consume high carbohydrate diets they're also consuming lots of fat and lots of calories you know um so like i mean if you're saying oh man these these all these carbs are awful look look at these donuts you know look at these uh, french fries etc they, like they're not just carbohydrate based foods they're also really high in fat and really high in overall calories and are really really palatable so when looking at carbohydrates in general and their role in uh, cardiovascular health long term i think there's a couple of different things you can look at so mm-hmm. firstly on the kind of positive side of things trying to consume a higher amount of dietary fiber um, consume uh, consuming whole whole grain based foods uh, beans legumes etc is a really good way of going about things okay so increases in dietary fiber really beneficial um, for cardiovascular health um, multiple mechanisms involved one of the potent ones there being that when you consume higher amounts of fiber literally acts almost like a medicine to increase the amount of cholesterol you excrete it's beautiful you know it's a real nice mechanism increased bile acid production takes cholesterol out of the body boom fiber doing its job okay it increases bile acid sequestering you said production. sequestering sequestering um yes sequestration there you go if you want to to focus on the sequestration process um but but yeah basically there you go. Like that's just one mechanism of the, the health promoting effects of fiber. Um, just while we're here, just because it's actually the next point that the recommendations mm-hmm. for fiber, 10 to 15 grams per thousand calories, roughly, you know, like obviously I'm not too worried if you get nine grams per thousand calories or 16 grams, you know, or if you go a little bit higher, perfectly fine for a lot of people. Some people do find they get GI distress uh, with that and um, with higher intakes, especially if they're not accustomed to it. Um, but 10 to 15 grams per thousand calorie, that's, that's a good place to be at, you know? And again, looking at the, the overall food matrix and looking at the overall choices you make, it's fairly easy to get 
and this goes into some of the next points we're going to get into as well um to get a good healthful diet like or rather if you're eating a healthful diet you know fruit veg all that kind of stuff it's pretty easy to get 10 to 15 grams per thousand calories like again you take your own 2,000 calories per day you know it's 20 grams 20 to 30 grams you need to get per day fairly easy to get if you are eating some fruit and veg eating some legumes and eating some like uh whole grain you know bread or oats or whatever you know very easy to get up to that 20 30 mark uh yes sir so so yeah that's the like the kind of health promoting side of 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 diet of carbohydrates is really trying to focus on uh things like whole grains, fibrous foods, beans, legumes, etc. Okay, so get on that. That's always a good thing. That doesn't mean that consuming more carbohydrates from refined carbohydrate sources um, is, is a good thing. Like that's not something that, that anyone's really going to suggest. Um, and there is a, a kind of a downside to carbohydrates as well. And that if you're con- consuming lots of um, sugary foods with added sugars that's probably not the best thing for cardiovascular health um if you're consuming really really high amounts of 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 sugar and that can increase triglycerides um and triglycerides basically become more of a problem um in the context of of high ldl Uh, so yeah that's basically how you should be thinking about this thinking about it all in context with the kind of ideal being that you're you know keeping your saturated fat low you're getting more of your your fats elsewhere and that you're keeping sugar a bit low getting your fiber in etc basically trying to create a, a pattern within the body that is overall um going to be healthy um without just focusing on one isolated thing so you know you could you could be taking care of the um the fat side of things but then if you're if you're eating ridiculous amounts of sugar can that still increase your triglycerides it can but that's more of a problem in the context of the high ldl so again there there is some complexity going on here um but in general like i'm not going to tell someone to eat loads and loads of sugar anyway for any aspect of health you know outside of sports performance um that doesn't mean that you can't have some sugar in your diet but just make sure you're looking after uh, your fiber needs and, and keeping the overall diet in check, you know, if sugar, again, it's like sugar is not just sugar, you know, it, it, there's a, there's a significant difference between get, having a high sugar intake that is in the context of you eating loads of pop tarts, loads of chocolate, etc., which, which is bringing other things with it as well versus consuming loads of blueberries, you know, um, loads of blueberries and apples and bananas, etc. It's, it's, it's a very different situation. Um, so yeah, that'd be most of my thoughts about carbohydrates. And again, you're, when you're thinking about carbohydrates in your diet, you're not just going to be thinking about purely how they impact um, any of these isolated markers. You're going to be thinking about your overall diet. So if you're an athlete, you're going to be eating a higher carbohydrate diet. If you're not an athlete, you have more flexibility to play around with macronutrients because it's just not something you need to, to sweat that much. So, so yeah, that's, that's carbs, bro. 100%. And this is one of the things as well with carbohydrates as well, especially when we talk about sugar. First of all, sugar like displaces other nutrients in the diet. You're either displacing other nutrients in the diet or you're consuming more nutrients in the diet, you know, which potentially both are negative. Like obviously if you're consuming more nutrients in the diet, that's a potentially we'll call it an obesogenic uh, environment. You know, it's a, at least a, a caloric surplus environment, right? Um, and if you're displacing other nutrients in the diet, you know, that's potentially lowering other beneficial things that are like, beneficial for health, you know? Um, like again, like polyphenols or micronutrients, which, is, which we'll t- touch on now next in a second. Um, if you're just having like high sugar intakes, you're potentially just not having higher you know, vegetable, fruit, whatever intakes, you know, but obviously sugar, like we, like what is sugar again, you know, people are like, like to be like, Oh, sugar. And what they really mean is like refined sugar, you know? And like, I'm not going to have an issue if someone's like, Oh, my sugar intake is a hundred grams per day. And I look at the sugar intake and like you said, it's like bananas, apples and you know, that kind of stuff. I'm like, like, this is in the the context of uh, an overall healthful diet pattern you know, like you're getting a lot of fiber, you're getting a lot of, you know, micronutrients, you're getting a lot of polyphenols and, you know, other uh, components in, in food. Um, and I'm like, this is not an issue for me, you know? However, again, with nutrition, like we said at the start, it's not a pick and choose menu. And oftentimes what you choose influences the, the overall health of the organism by virtue of what you now don't have in the diet, you know? So if you're literally like, Oh, it's grand. They said sugar isn't too much of an issue once, you know, we'll say calories are controlled for and not in a, uh, a, a caloric surplus. And um, 
you know, that's not necessarily the case because you now aren't getting all of these other beneficial nutrients because you're choosing to literally just eat table sugar instead, you know? <laughs> so, uh, like we do have to take that stuff into account. Now, again, does that mean you can never have some candy or sweets or anything ever again? No, of course not. You know, that's again, the diet isn't a set thing every single day. Like I don't think you're going to have, Oh, I had a, I don't know, some Haribo today. And I actually, you know, I've just dramatically increased my risk of heart disease and obesity and diabetes and everything. I'm like, it's just not the case. You know, if your diet is literally on point, 99% of the time you're eating an overall healthful diet, just not worried about the occasional high sugar foods, you know, would you agree with that Gary? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Which brings us to the next point, which is I've just labeled it like polyphenols and micronutrients, right? Mm -hmm. Because like we could spend all day here going through all of the different polyphenols. I say all of them as if we know them all, we just don't. Um, um, or bioactive components of food um, and obviously the micronutrients as well. Um, we could spend all day going through them all, right? But we're not going to. Um, and instead, what I'm just going to say is getting a higher intake of polyphenols, bioactive components and micronutrients seems to be good buzz for heart disease prevention, right? So eat a micronutrient dense, healthful diet and you're good to go, you know? Um, that's, I don't think that's too outlandish to suggest, you know, would you agree, Gary? Yeah. Like, I mean, it's, it's pretty simple and it really comes as a virtue of just trying to achieve a diet that is overall, um, dense in nutrients. And, and obviously as a result of pursuing things like, oh, I want to increase my polyphenol content, you're going to be consuming more fruits and vegetables. You know? So, I mean, the, these things again, do not act in a vacuum and the way that these nutrients act in isolation, um, is one thing to try and understand and then tr to try and understand how they all interact together is another animal, you know? So there's, there's a, there's a lot to this and um, there's back and forth. And, you know, one example with that, of that would be like when we discussed, as we'll discuss in a moment as well, we discussed like sodium intake, but then we said, oh, sodium intake and potassium intake, they kind of interact together. And, you know, there seems to be some, some effect there between them. Um, and that, that, that occurs for many different nutrients within the body. So I think um, understanding that is it just, just helps a little bit, helps you to avoid getting caught up in uh, isolated nutrient discussions, because sometimes what you'll see is um, you'll read an article and it'll be like, focus on this one micronutrient for cardiovascular disease. And it's, it's just rarely that simple, you know, rarely ever that simple. Uh, yeah, which actually so. brings us to the next point, which is calcium intake, because this is one that people are like, oh, calcium, like it, the research is actually so muddy. If you like, if you don't know what you're actually looking for, or you don't, oh, I'm going to say biased here, but if you don't understand biochemistry, you're just going to be like, what the fuck does this even mean, right? Because you'll see studies where people give or have higher calcium intakes and they have lower heart disease risk. And you'll see studies where like they have the exact same you know, calcium intake and they're like higher. Yeah, I said lower, didn't I? Yeah, so higher uh, heart disease risk, you know? Um, so you're like, what the fuck is going on here? And it does appear to be like a case of the, the manner in which you consume the calcium, but also in the context of all the other stuff that you're doing, right? Now, the, I, I don't want people to think when I discuss this, that this is like, oh my God, the magnitude of effect of this is so, so big that, you know, I need to follow this rather than any other bit of advice, the saturated fat, the anything else. I'm like, no, this is the thing, right? But I just wanted to mention it because it does give more context for what we were just saying there, how like things are synergistic and then also the, the food matrix and all that sort of stuff has to be taken into account because when people are fed isolated and, you know, calcium supplements, um, like without a meal and especially in the context or in the context of, you know, higher vitamin D three, um, levels or intake and, um, or a high or, and, or a high protein, uh, diet, both of which, you know, increase calcium absorption, we'll say, um, they tend to have higher risk of heart disease, you know, and that appears to be the speed at which the, the calcium is absorbed, you know, um, and this is also especially true in the context of lower vitamin K levels, right? Because again, we'll say vitamin K is like telling your body where to put the calcium. Like that's not the entirety of it, but you know, vitamin K levels we'll say are associated with calcium in the bones or sorry, higher vitamin K levels are associated with calcium in the bones versus calcium in your arteries, which is, you know, not exactly ideal for the old heart disease stuff. And um, so 
with that in mind, I probably wouldn't suggest someone supplement with calcium. However, I'm not worried about a higher calcium intake if we are having it from like drinking milk or eating fruit and veg that are like higher in calcium. You know, that's not a worry for me, right? So effectively, the only reason I bring this up is because that is something that people will look at. They'll look at a, an isolated nutrient and be like, oh, this seems to be positively correlated with health, you know, um, or seems to be positively correlated with this disease process, in this case, heart disease. You know, I better go out and buy a supplement for it, right? And in my mind, I'm like, that's, that's the last thing you want to do. The, the first thing is, where can I get this from food, right? Because there's probably either synergists or there is more of a, we'll say a homeostatic mechanism to regulate the absorption or the intake or whatever when you're actually eating it from food versus when you're just getting it from a supplement, right? And that brings me to the next point as well, which is if you are going to supplement with anything, you know, you should look at the counterindications. You know, is there, is this counterindicated for a certain disease process or whatever? Because you'll see this as well where people are like, <clears throat> oh, uh, micronutrient or uh, multi uh, vitamins are bad for your health. You know, there was research that came out to suggest that people who take multivitamins have negative health consequences down the road. I'm like, this is just completely abstract from like reality, you know? Um, we have to take the, the entire food matrix, how they consume it, the rest of their diet. Like, are they taking a, a, a multivitamin because they're like, my diet is actually fucking trash. So, you know, I'm going to just hedge my bets here, you know? Like that could be the case, you know? So we, we have to take a lot more than just looking at things in isolation into account when we are actually trying to supplement. Like you should treat supplements like pharmacotherapy. You know, you wouldn't just be like, all right, just give me this random drug, you know? So why do you do it just because the drug is over the counter? You know, like you should be digging a little bit deeper into this stuff um, if you are going to be going out and buying supplements. However, I actually just don't think people should be supplementing with calcium if they are uh, you know they're they're thinking about their heart disease risk and i would just rather see it from the diet you know do you have anything else to say on that yeah like i'm not i as i said to you before the podcast i'm not massively familiar with the research on on calcium supplementation and cardiovascular disease itself um but i mean like when you actually look at the the dietary stuff in terms of like when people have higher intakes of calcium um i think that in the general consensus there is that that is beneficial for cardiovascular health and i mean if you think back to the to the blood pressure discussion i'm not sure if we even discussed it in that episode but i mean when you look at calcium calcium intake and blood pressure it does seem like there's a positive effect there at least um without even going into to any other area of cardiovascular health so i mean are you going to be concerned about consuming calcium based foods no um but but yeah supple supplementation is is a different ball game the only caveat i would add there as well um is that obviously um if someone is uh, has has osteoporosis and they've worked, they're working with a, a doctor who's prescribed them you know calcium and vitamin d3 or whatever um that's a totally different recommendation um to to us saying that you shouldn't take calcium supplements for cardiovascular health um, there are indications for everything and when prescribing is like as you said when you're prescribed a medication uh, that is prescribed with uh, other uh, side effects and contraindications in mind. And the same thing for, uh, for supplementation. If a doctor is prescribing a particular supplement for a disease state, they're going to be considering um, how that might interact with other comorbid comorbidities you might have, for example. So, so yeah, just don't go out and read one article that says, hey, let's uh, supplement with calcium and then go taking five grams a day, you know? <laughs> And also there's obviously ways, again, I can say again, the osteoporosis example, like there are obviously ways to reduce any negatives associated with this, like just eat it with food. Like if you're going to have a calcium supplement, take it with food. It just slows the, the rate of absorption down. Unreal. Like you've just maybe got rid of 50% of the risk, you know, I'm obviously just pulling that out of my ass, but you know, like you, there, there are ways in which you can have a more healthful intake of prescribed supplements. You know, and um, again, like maybe you want to get your K2 levels checked, or maybe that's something that you want to research a little bit more yourself and then discuss it with your doctor. You know, like maybe you're like, actually, you know what? I don't eat all of these, you know, vegetables or any other sources of vitamin K2. So maybe that is something that I should be aware of. Let me discuss that with my doctor who prescribed calcium supplements to me, you know, and um, 
same with vitamin D. If you're just like, you know what, they, they prescribe vitamin D. We never got a blood test for vitamin D. I'm actually always out in the sun. I live in, I don't know, California or something. You know, maybe that's less of a concern for you, you know? Um, but again, it's, it's something you need to discuss with your doctor if they are prescribing something to you or your, your dietitian or your nutritionist or whatever. Like the, you, this is stuff that, like, like we, we discuss with nutrition all the time. Like it's individualized, you know? So you, you have to weigh up those risks about yourself if you're individualizing it for yourself. But if someone is individualizing something for you, then they should have a, a clear pro, uh, you know, reasoning and rationale as to why they have prescribe this or you know recommended this um with all your other stuff in mind you know and um, but anyway look i actually just don't think it's a big issue i just wanted to bring it up because it's a good example in terms of you know this isn't a, just a case of like oh i'll just supplement with things it's like we we need to take the food matrix into account we need to take a, a lot more into account some things are synergistic some things are detractive um, or anti-synergistic <laughs> um, and it's not just this, as simple as like oh I can just supplement things away because that's often what happens when you read this stuff which brings me to the next one which is antioxidant supplements right people are like oh uh, an oxidative environment seems to be negative for heart disease risk you know so obviously like we have these antioxidant supplements we can just you know take some vitamin e you know um, or any of these other numerous antioxidants and all of a sudden I'll have good health, you know, and that just doesn't seem to be the case, you know, like having a, a higher antioxidant uh, intake in the diet overall seems to be quite beneficial for, for health, you know, however, just supplementing blindly with antioxidants doesn't seem to be beneficial. Like it doesn't seem to create any meaningful change especially if you already have uh, advancements in heart disease you know like you're not going to reverse your heart disease um, if you just take some antioxidants like it just doesn't work like that you know so you can't just supplement away uh, a poor diet pattern overall you know like there's a, there's all that vitamin e research that's i just brought that up because again like there's a lot on that you know but also you will read stuff like uh, like I said, I mentioned the cooking with uh, polyunsaturated fats. I'm like, oh, it's not something that I would be, uh, you know, for. Um, however, like the polyunsaturated fat that you choose could have uh, a huge content of, you know, antioxidants. And as a result, you know, doesn't get oxidized in the cooking environment, you know? And as a result, you're like, all right, well, any negatives that potentially was there from, you know, oxidation of these fats, you know, it's somewhat negated by the antioxidants. So again, then you can start thinking in your head, like, yes, I actually need to supplement with these antioxidants because that's obviously going to stop this oxidative environment. And to an extent, it's correct. However, you just don't get a biological free lunch with this stuff. You know, you, you unfortunately have to eat a healthful antioxidant rich uh, diet to get the effects, you know, like, yeah, you might get some effects from supplementing with like extra vitamin e or whatever but it generally works better in the context of getting it from your actual diet itself you know would you agree with that gary i have nothing to add to that to be honest you would be pro or anti-antioxidant supplements to for heart disease no i'm anti-antioxidant supplements <laughs> if, if, if they're if they're beneficial for, for, from the diet like absolutely you know far away but i i haven't seen anything that's compelling about actually supplementing with additional um antioxidant supplements um, mm -hmm. but again like not not certainly not my area of expertise so i don't think you should necessarily trust me trust me <laughs> sorry you. <laughs> you're listening to our podcast but i'm just going to tell you that anyway <laughs> Um, the only actually, I should put it out there because people do actually uh, wonder about it. Like the only antioxidant supplements that I would be probably pro uh, for, like as in, well, actually two things. Firstly, like people like to think about antioxidant supplements and they're like, oh, well, this is going to be beneficial for, you know, health and whatever. Like if you take antioxidant supplements after resistance training, you're probably going to negate the effects of resistance training to some degree, right? So and we can already see that antioxidant supplements could potentially be negative, right? So don't just assume they're good because you're like, oh, oxidation, bad, you know? Like yeah. sometimes oxidation, good, you know? Like that's what I want when I'm trying to get my calves to be 20 inches. Um, 
that's what I'm just going to start saying, Gary. I'm just going to be like, oh, I just actually took too many antioxidants and that's why my calves don't grow or just why my muscles don't grow, full stop. Um, but anyway, uh, so antioxidants or an oxidative environment isn't necessarily bad, you know? In some contexts, it is. In, in certain disease processes, et cetera, um, it is bad. So potentially thinking of antioxidant intake from the diet especially can be quite beneficial, right? But I don't think supplementing with an antioxidant supplement itself would be a good idea in general you know <clears throat> i don't think it's it's going to give you as much bang for your book as you know food however if you're like oh i want to i actually think you know maybe i do want to supplement with some sort of antioxidant supplement the way i would do this if you're like i'm very i, I want to do this the way i would do this is just get some like a greens smoothie antioxidant drink you know like a or i say green smoothie like any kind of uh you know, powdered greens, any kind of powdered vegetables, fruit or whatever, you know, like that potentially, if you're like, oh, I need to supplement, I, I, that's the way I'm going to do it. Like, that's probably how I would do it because you get a lot of the actual food components as well. Um, and also you get other beneficial stuff. It's not like just high dose vitamin E or something, you know, um, what would be your thoughts on that, Gary? Would you be pro uh, drinking a greens smoothie to get your antioxidants yeah i'm not i'm not i'm not anti <laughs> anti antioxidant smoothie like basically my like my perspective is pretty simple on this stuff i'm like look you're going to get a relatively high intake of antioxidant compounds through consuming a diet that is high in fruit and vegetables and if you feel like you're not taking care of that if you need to take a green smoothie please be my guest, you know, um, like it is one of those things again, where, like you said, you know, if you're trying to take care of every last thing and if something is, does not lead to harm and is theoretically in some way beneficial, I'm like, you can do what you want. It's your money, you know, but I, I'm not going to go like some of those greens powders, man, Jesus, they're expensive. Like, um, so I'm not going to go recommend that to all my clients. And even on, even on like the hypertrophy and muscle building stuff, like, I think that's, I think that's just a good illustration of where, you can take an isolated thing related to nutrition and totally run away, run away with it. Because basically like what you've got is you had an initial school of thought where, Oh yeah, have antioxidant supplements uh, around training. It's going to be beneficial because it's going to blunt uh, uh, muscle damage, etc. And then you've got like a second layer to that, which says, actually we want that stuff. So you need to make sure to not consume um, antioxidants around the training window, which then gets exaggerated to like not consuming an orange or blueberries after your workout. Um, and even like, if you're taking some sort of anti, like if you're taking a, a gram or two of vitamin C or whatever, after you work out, like, is that a big deal? Like, it's just, it's just not really a big deal. Um, so like, I mean, these things have layers to them. Um, but it basically comes back to like nutrition just, isn't as simple as, as we'd like it to be. Unfortunately. Right. Now there's a few more. We're nearly there. <laughs> the next one is just salt intake. Right. And again, we discussed this a little bit more in the blood pressure stuff. Um, this is pretty straightforward. You want to get a nice little balance between potassium and sodium. Um, like obviously you can take more if you are like excessively sweating. Like I fucking sweat my absolute fucking balls off every time I train. Like I feel sorry for everyone I do jujitsu with because and I'm sweating two bits. Um, it's great for no gi though because I'm just like <clears throat> slip out. It's like I fucking bathed in baby oil beforehand. But anyway, look, that's an aside. Um, but uh, yeah, like if you're excessively sweating or you're engaged in resistance training or cardiovascular training of any kind or sport training, you know, you probably can eat more salt, you know, and be fairly okay. However, for the vast majority of people, I would probably be pretty confident in just saying like limit your sodium chloride intake to less than five grams per day, you know, and you'd be like, it's, it's pretty good, you know, get a little bit more potassium, maybe, maybe mix it up between like a, a low salt or what are they called? What's it called in America? Can't remember. Anyway, like a potassium based salt. Um, that was pretty handy, you know, mix it up every so often, maybe one day or one meal you have, you know, sodium chloride or just sodium, you know, you're just like uh, sea salt or whatever. Um, and the next one you have like a low salt or, you know, you mix and match, you know, no necessarily like, Oh, I need to get this exact amount of grams of this. Um, but as long as you're not eating like high salt foods, you know, like processed meats, packaged meats, whatever, like uh, as a daily thing, I'm not too worried about this. Um, cause obviously we're coming to this from the perspective that 
most people are resistance training or training in some capacity who are listening to this, you know? So that's the, the kind of bias that I'm coming to this with. So I'm like, you know, a lot of these individuals are actually salt deficient because they eat chicken and broccoli and rice, you know? And it's like, that's, that's their diet, you know? And in that case, you know, you can probably make a strong argument that you should be increasing your, your salt intake, you know? But uh, in the context of heart disease, you know, I probably would somewhat limit it. Um, and this is also easy to see the effects of because you can just, very easily monitor your blood pressure. If your blood pressure is okay, you can just kind of assume that your salt intake is okay. Yes, sir. Um, on your sweating note, my girlfriend woke me up last night uh, in the middle of the night uh, to ask me if I wet myself, urinated myself, because I was fucking drenched, literally soaking, swimming around the bed. It was just so wet. I didn't wet myself. I was actually just sweating so much. <laughs> so I'm telling you, man, these are the unspoken about problems of being a male who trains, you know? Maybe this is a, a, a woman problem as well. I don't actually know, but in general, <laughs> this seems to be a consistent uh, thing where I speak to, speak to people who train quite hard and their uh, female partners uh, are disgusted by the, the amount that they sweat. So yeah, I'm, this is something that needs to be talked about. Yeah, but they're gonna go through menopause eventually, and then you're gonna have your time when they're having <laughs> Comes, yeah. flashes, cold flashes, night sweats, whatever the fuck. So you just remind her of that, you know? <laughs> yeah, my poor, my poor dad actually gets the raw end of the deal because my mother is actually just, all, just always roasting. She's just one of those people. So she sleeps with the window like literally wide open Same. and he's just like... <laughs> But anyway, there you go, guys. Um, that's that's my sweat story. But yeah, I completely agree. You know, salt, as we said, look, most people are getting most of their dietary salt in the form of not added salt on a healthful meal. It's coming from uh, processed foods, from junk foods, you know. So, I mean, don't be consuming lots of that stuff. Um, tastes so great. Like, don't. <laughs> tastes great, you know. I mean, if you're having if you're having chips and pizza and burgers, etc., very regularly, and you're eating lots of crisps and stuff like that, like clearly that's just not healthy. You don't need us to tell you that, um, and that's off, often contributing a lot of the salt that comes in through one's diet. And that's often my concern when it comes to, when I see people who say, "Oh, you know, add loads of salt." You know, that's what you need to do. All this salt information is just a it's just a conspiracy. It's not actually true. Um, like that might be the case for someone who's a very hard training individual, eats a really quote unquote clean diet. Like you said, they make an effort not to add any sauces. It's all whole foods. You actually might need to add some salt in order to uh, support your performance if you're an active individual. Uh, but for most people, most people aren't active enough in the first place. Uh, most people consume lots of uh, foods that are inherently very high in salt. Um, and they're also not eating many vegetables or a healthful diet in general. So I think uh, the advice to limit salt intake is fairly robust um, for most people. Dead right, Kerry. Right, next one. Uh, body fat. It's inflammatory. Fat. Yeah, I mean, this it's a it's a it's a pretty simple thing, you know, don't be, don't be excessively fat. And I, I say that in quite a blunt manner, but it's, it's obviously not that simple. Like you can't just like say, Oh yeah, cheers. Cheers, Gary. I actually didn't know that being fat was bad. So I'm actually just going to get rid of it and I'll be right back. You know, obviously it is far more complicated and we uh, appreciate that, you know, people end up in a situation where they have excess body fat for many, many different reasons. You know, uh, there's many different, and things that contribute um, to obesity. Um, and that obviously varies between individuals. And it's not just a, a simple case of saying, oh, yeah, thanks. You know, you actually just told me now that it's bad. So I'm going to change. So clearly for anyone who is um, overweight or obese, um, there's a process of behavior change that one needs to work through that can be complex. It can be challenging. It can be something that takes quite a while to get through. But in general, what you do see is that there is um, a, a risk of cardiovascular disease that is increased by being excessively fat, um, independent of other variables. So that is one of the things that's interesting is that even when you look at individuals who are categorized as being metabolically healthy obese, you know, so if you were to, you know, someone might be classified as obese in terms of the actual classifications, but when you look at their uh, blood lipids and their blood pressure, et cetera, everything seems to be in a good place. Even for that individual who has those uh, markers in a good place, 
they still have elevated risk. Um, so that's clearly a problem because that's what we're concerned about. And the other uh, troubling thing there is that most of these individuals are not, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of individuals who have that metabolically healthy obese phenotype over the years, when you follow them, when there's been multiple follow-up studies of five and 10 years, a lot of people do still go on to uh, become metabolically unhealthy and develop these additional risk factors. So you've got an independent risk of cardiovascular disease that's associated with being obese. Um, and then you've got an elevated risk of going on to develop other um, markers of, of ill metabolic health. And hence, overall, it would be wise to try and maintain a healthy body composition. And in general, when you do see weight loss interventions, um, especially for blood pressure, uh, you do see that that weight loss uh, does, abs does absolutely help. It can also help um, blood lipids as well. Um, and more importantly than focusing on isolated surrogate markers, uh, it reduces cardiovascular risk. So, so yeah, that's that's where we're at with the with the obesity discussion and in terms of like body fat in general like i think the other interesting thing is that it's not just about being like class two class three obesity um for body fat to be a problem because like one of the interesting things is that when you look at the kind of the the lipid panels or lipoprotein profiles that are most of a problem for cardiovascular disease the kind of typical one associated with like the metabolic syndrome or diabetes is that um, after the most atherogenic, uh, the one with the most atherogenic potential is low LDL, high triglycerides and low, uh, did I say low LDL? Sorry, high LDL, high triglycerides um, and low HDL. And there's also some remodeling of the LDL particles where they're smaller and denser and more atherogenic. So basically, if you've got that sort of that sort of presentation, it's typically associated with um, diabetes and the metabolic syndrome. And you that basically occurs um, most likely when you exceed some sort of personal fat threshold. And that's going to vary between individuals. And I think we discussed it with Alan, but we've definitely discussed it ourselves as well, where visceral uh, body fat tissue is particularly a, a problem. So, I mean, you could be an individual, like, and this is more probably associated with with males in general who are, have more central adiposity so that kind of typical uh, android male body fat distribution where more body fat is around the midsection versus the limbs uh, whereas the more kind of gynoid female presentation would be more body fat in in the lower body for example and around the breasts so that's going to be a little bit more healthful so it's not just about saying fat itself is bad yes there are there are pro problems with body fat uh, in and of itself regardless of where it is you could say but that risk is further um subclassified uh, and stratified by where the body fat is stored and if you've got lots of body fat that's around your liver and pancreas for example you might have body fat in those areas without even looking particularly overweight uh, from the outside or your bmi might be fine but you could still have elevated cardiovascular risk purely because of, of where that is distributed. So, so yeah, that's why all of this comes together. Like for example, a lot of those body fat distribution patterns can be associated with things like insulin resistance. So you could be someone who's exercising um, and doing uh, other health behaviors that still reduce your risk. So it, it is about considering the whole picture. And I think that's important for people uh, who are classified as obese, who have excess body fat, that, you know, weight loss is not your only option and that you can still engage in all of those other behaviors um, and improve your health. Because I think that's something that's um, overwhelmingly positive about people who are trying to promote messages related to promoting health, uh, health at every size, essentially. I don't agree with that, with the overall or everything that some of those people push. Um, but I think in general, promoting the fact that health, uh, health promoting behaviors can be weight neutral. I think that's a, a really positive message. Uh, would you agree? A hundred percent. I agree. I also think it's fairly reckless when doctors go in and like someone that's wondering about their heart disease risk and they just go all oh, right step on that scales there oh yeah yeah, yeah. And, and it's just like lose weight and that's your only option i think that that is dumb <laughs> uh, it's, it's actually reckless like as we were saying here like i'm like i want to just present these things just to give you launching points for further you know research your own self as we'll call it research um you know further investigation yourself and be like hmm, they said something about this maybe that's something that i should look into rather than potentially looking into like Oh, all I hear is the saturated fat stuff or all I hear because of the population that I'm in is the obesity or diabetes 
uh, stuff. And um, it's like, there's other stuff you can do. Yeah, it might not be the, the magnitude of effect or you know the magnitude of effect of one of these other things might be small, um, but there are other things to be thinking of, you know? And like you said, like, I'm not worried like too much if there is an individual that we'll call them over fat, you know, um, if there's an individual that is over fat and they are presenting and they're like, Oh, I'm worried about my heart disease risk. And they have, they exercise regularly. Their overall diet pattern is, you know, good. They have their, whatever we'll say, 10% as saturated fat, you know, they're doing everything else, you know, on point. I'm like, I'm not too worried about it. Like, yeah, we can start working on the, the obesity or the over fatness or whatever you want to call it. Um, but it's not going to be the, like the deciding factor for me. I'm like, I'd rather see someone with all these other things uh, on point rather than being like, oh, you, you just have, you know, 2% too much body fat for me, for my liking. So uh, we're going to really work on that, you know? Um, which also bears noting that there is also a range for this stuff, you know? Um, like you can, you can be too low on body fat. Obviously that's just less likely than, you know, having too much body fat. Um, but also, and it bears noting that you, again, you can be completely healthy. You can be completely like, you know, jacked out of your mind, completely like shredded abs on show and still get heart disease, you know? hundred percent. So like, don't, don't think just because, Oh, the, the lad said, uh, you know, body fat and inflammation seem to be linked. And um, that means that, uh, because I have low body fat, I'm in a good place. Like that's, that's not necessarily the, the correlation, you know, it's like, yeah, it's potentially more likely. However, I know individuals that are, you know, in way better metabolic shape and they are higher on the body fat range, you know? Um, however, I probably would be a proponent of at least managing, uh, body fatness so that it's in a, a range that does actually lead to long-term health for the individual. Right. Cause again, we have to caveat that with the individual, mm -hmm. perhaps for you, it's, 25% and you're like, yeah, I actually feel great. My blood lipids are great. You know, over time they seem to be actually improving, you know, um, we're in a good place. You know, my other health habits are squared away. I'm like, I'm not too worried then. You know, if, it, if all, all the stuff that we can measure is on point and you're happy, you know, you're not like, I actually hate myself and you know, I have all these fucking terrible body image disorders and whatever. I'm like, like, I'm not, I'm not too worried if, we're in a good place with everything, you know? However, if we're not in a good place with things or things are trending in the wrong direction, then that probably is something that I would be looking at, uh, assuming that we've already looked at all the other stuff, you know, that we, we can look at. And you're like, all right, well, the only thing that we potentially have to work on now is body fatness. So we're going to have to work on doing something about that, you know, either reducing calories, which is also uh, a thing as well. It's not necessarily the, the body fatness, that is the issue. It is potentially the, the higher calorie environment along with uh, a higher inflammatory environment because body fat itself is inflammatory, you know? So you're combining a few things and that needs to be taken into account. Like if you have a higher body fat level and you are, you know, in a, a calorie deficit, you know, you're dieting and um, it's like, well, that's potentially different than someone that is, you know, of a higher body fat level and, eating in a caloric surplus over time, you know? So the overall context does need to be taken into account. But anyway, that brings me to the next point, which is exercise. Exercise, while inflammatory itself, is ultimately anti-inflammatory, you know? It allows you to deal with inflammation much better, which is great because, again, it lowers inflammation. But it also provides uh, a situation where you can burn through, you know, we'll, we'll call it uh, energy in the blood and um, so you actually get lipid lowering effects you get uh, like lowering of triglycerides i mean i don't mean like just ldl lowering effects <laughs> and it, it, while, while you're doing it you get lowered glucose you get all that kind of stuff you're basically providing some sort of like sink for you know all this stuff that's high in the blood you know and um, because you're burning through it you know and um, it also helps with weight regulation so that's obviously beneficial as well as we just discussed um, and related to this is obviously like increasing your muscle mass. Again, you better blood glucose control, better blood lipids in general, again, depending on how you get to that point. Like obviously if you're fucking jacked out of your mind because you're on 
fucking 10 grams of trend like that's obviously different than if you're just you know someone who has increased their muscle mass over time because they enjoy resistance training um so exercise do again like we've discussed before a combination of resistance training um and cardiovascular training and you're good to go with that stuff and do you have anything else to say on the the exercise component gary yeah i mean like exercise is just it's just the chat really when it comes to to cardiovascular health um i mean there's there's so many levels to where exercise could potentially be beneficial um i think one of them that maybe goes unmeasured at times is that the act of exercising itself and becoming someone who exercises and act like in the real world, it tends to be associated with people actually making dietary changes, like without anything else going on, because as you exercise, you become ingrained in some sort of culture where, Oh, right. Like what, what other things can I do for my health? And even if someone doesn't even care about their health, often people end up making performance based or body composition based nutrition decisions when they start to exercise or train that also confer health benefits. So I think exercise um, is just something that everyone should try and engage in, in some sort. Um, I think that from a health perspective, I think there's also a lot to be said for um, engaging in some sort of exercise that maybe it has some sort of group mentality where you're all trying to kind of get better together. And like, maybe there's exchange of information related to health and nutrition, et cetera, or that it's maybe uh, performance based where there's a very clear drive for you to keep coming back each week and do better and to change your nutrition to support that. But obviously that's kind of like a 10,000 foot view of like how exercise could be beneficial. Like overall, like, I mean, the, the cardiorespiratory fitness component itself in terms of having a higher VO2 max, uh, that's something that's beneficial. The act of exercising itself and, and the, the, the contraction of the muscles, as you said, how that helps um, with uh, basically teaches your muscles to act as a sink for blood glucose, super beneficial. Um, and and there's, just, there's just so many different la- layers to how exercise could potentially help, even to the, the end of, like, as we said in one of the previous episodes, like if you're well trained you have a good good anaerobic fitness then when you do eventually have a heart attack if you do that you could even have greater resistance to that purely by virtue of your fitness characteristics that's something that'll probably be teased out more in future research but it's just an interesting kind of point and i think even further than that the disability that is associated with having something like a stroke or heart attack or whatever that's going to be reduced by virtue of the fact that you've been training all your life as well. You know? So, I mean, it's going to be, if you do end up having a heart attack and you're bed bound for a couple of weeks or whatever, um, then if you've got more muscle mass as a reserve, more of a physiological reserve of fitness, you're actually going to have a longer, higher quality of life, even if you do succumb to these events. So, so yeah, I think when it comes to exercise, looking at it purely in terms of its effect on blood pressure, which is really potent by the way, or its effect on, um, lipids or whatever, I think you actually fail to see all of the potential benefits that that exercise could potentially have, you know, even in terms of like the, the liver fat discussion and the visceral adiposity, it seems like there's, there's some evidence for, you know, exercise just being independent, independently reducing that, um, regardless of kind of the rest of your body composition anyway. So, so yeah, there's, there's a lot to it, but I mean, if you've listened, if you're listening to this podcast, like just, you should be training, you know? Do some training. So what you're saying, Gary, is I need to get my heart, my resting heart rate down to sub 35 for health. Of course. <laughs> Wonderful. I'll try to get 27. I think I think that's a good a good mark. <laughs> anyway, we have just a few more just to touch on. Um, these are just quick ones. Um, processed food again tends to be high in like nitrates, higher in sodium, and uh, generally consumed in the context of a poorer diet. So yeah, I'm less likely to recommend processed foods. You know, that's not to say that processed foods are necessarily bad. You know, it's just I wouldn't make them the, the base of my diet. If you're going on a fucking hike and you're like, oh, I had some beef jerky and brought it with me, uh, am I going to die now of heart disease? I'm like, it's just not. That's just not an issue for me. You know, or if you're like, oh yeah, again, I went on a hike camping and you know had some sausages and you know some other processed meats and whatever. I'm like, I just. It's just not a, a big deal for me, right? Um, however, if you're just like, yeah, I was actually just sat at home like I do every night uh, watching Netflix and uh, yeah, I had a, an entire steak of chorizo. I'm like, okay, well, we've, we've actually got an issue here, <laughs> you know? Um, so Delicious though. <laughs> processed meats, not, not generally something I would be like, yeah, let's, let's, let's get them in the diet. Processed foods in general, again, like we're talking, you know, 
uh, higher carbohydrate ones like sweets, candy, that kind of shit. Um, again, it's place, displacing other nutrients. Excuse me. And if it's not displacing other nutrients, it's a calorie surplus, which again leads to higher body fat, higher weight. We were talking about the sugar, all that stuff. So again, processed foods, I'm probably limiting them. I'm probably going to, you know, a whole natural food based diet, um, you know, real food, quote unquote, um, wherever possible. Again, it's not to say that all of these foods are bad. Like again, like we could definitely say like cheese is processed food. We could definitely say that yogurt is processed food. Like there's, there's so many things that are technically processed food, which we just don't categorize them. Like, you know, people are like, Oh, I eat a, I eat a only natural food and they're eating butter. I'm like, this is processed, you know? Um, so again, it depends. I just probably wouldn't be eating a lot of processed foods. Do you have anything to add to that? <clears throat> no, I mean, pretty basic, you know? Pretty straightforward. Next one is just red meat. Um, obviously red meat has, in general, uh, a bad rap when it comes to uh, heart disease. And that's somewhat, uh, you know, understandable and somewhat just, you know, misguided. Um, Obviously, red meat generally tends to, again, what we think of red meat, generally tends to have higher saturated fat and iron as well. Two of these potentially can lead to increased, well, saturated fat does, um, but iron as well can lead to increased heart disease risk. Um, so maybe it's not something that we want to be consuming lots of. However, that hurts my feelings as someone who is very patriotic to Ireland mm -hmm. because being anti-red meat inherently means that you're anti-cattle and being anti-cattle is not just unpatriotic, it's actually anti-patriotic in Ireland because we are a cattle farming uh, nation, a pastoral society. And um, as much as people in Dublin or Cork like to pretend it's not, um, if anything, we should be increasing the herd. Um, but anyway, look, that's, that's a complete other discussion. But uh, yeah, I probably wouldn't be consuming like only red meat you know i definitely would be mixing especially fish in there um and maybe some poultry um maybe some other plant-based proteins um or again like you, we can talk about it another time but like doing something like veal or you know things like veal is literally like zero percent fucking saturated fat and people are like, oh, my God, red meat. It's like, as if red meat is just one category of things, you know? Like, I don't know, some people like to categorize veal, like, you know, deer, um, as not red meat somehow, even though it's definitely red meat. <laughs> um, so, again, with the, with the red meat discussion, I'm like, man, this is like such a, a low-tier thing to be worrying about unless you have everything else um, looked after. And I'm not worried about it if it's in the context of, like, you have you know, uh, uh, a leaner cut of red meat um, in your diet. However, as Gary was just saying before we got on this podcast, a lot of people just don't eat lean cuts of meat. You know, like they're literally just like, yeah, 20% uh, fat uh, mince. Yeah, of course, I'll just bang that into my lasagna there. Um, or, you know, it's like, oh, a fatty cut of steak. Yeah, of course. I, and I'll eat the, the fat on the side of it as well, you know? Yeah. Um, so, and, I'll, and I'll cook it in butter because that's that's what we do, you know. And um, so, by recommending lowering red meat, it inherently lowers the intake of saturated fat, and also generally tends to lead to a quote unquote better or healthful diet pattern, you know. And um, so, I'm in a in a quandary here, Gary, in terms of suggesting we lower red meat intake, but also being inherently patriotic to my country. Yeah, like personally, like I'm a I'm a big like red meat fan, you know. Obviously, again, we're Irish, we love our steak, you know. Can't get away from it. But but yeah, look, I mean, looking at looking at the actual the actual evidence and considering this from like solely a scientific perspective, without my food preferences in mind, um, I think that when people are, I think that the recommendations to uh, lower red meat in general, um, when thinking again population level um i think they do make sense i think from a saturated fat perspective and i think from the perspective of even colorectal cancer um i think the the recommendations to reduce red meat and particularly um processed meat i i do think uh, i would absolutely uh, stand by them and um, that doesn't mean again like when you see this stuff 
this obviously gets kind of weaponized, you could say, if you want to take it that seriously, by people who are, you know, on the vegan side of things who say, you know, hey, look, all the recommendations say lower your red meat. It doesn't mean zero. Um, and again, I think you have to keep the overall uh, diet in context because obviously we don't want to, if I think a public, mes- a public health message to tell everyone to go vegan, I think that'd be reckless. Like, I, I don't think that is, um, that would be uh, appropriate at all. And I think that when you look at the research on, for example, the effect of, of, of dietary protein on muscle mass and the, uh, the avoidance of sarcopenia as someone ages, I think it's very difficult to begin to look at health through solely like an isolated lens of like reducing cardiovascular risk. I think you also have to consider what, what dietary factors actually lead to higher levels of muscle mass. And often there's actually a degree of conflict there between the dietary patterns that people consume to gain muscle and dietary patterns that lead to cardiovascular health. So I think that's one of the difficult things about nutrition is that you actually have to be willing to say, look, I'm going to wrestle with these few different things, which don't neatly tie together, but appreciate that there are trade-offs, um, with different dietary patterns. So yeah, look, um, as you said, uh, when people do consume high amounts of, of red meat, uh, for example, through burgers, etc., cetera, um, it does uh, tend to lead to elevated levels of saturated fat in the diet. Um, and I think that in addition to that, like it's very important, like if you're someone who reads nutrition research, you have to take a step back and say, what are people doing in the real world? And when I when I'm doing that, I'm thinking about like, all right, like what what would my dad? What, how would my dad change his diet if someone said uh, saturated fat doesn't matter, eat whatever you want? You know, that gives permission then for the typical kind of uh, the the typical uh, Irish person in maybe their forties, fifties, sixties to go back to just saying, oh, great, I can have my fry up in the morning uh, with you know cooked in butter, butter on the toast, etc. And it's like. Yeah, look for someone like myself or yourself, Patty, who's saying, who's looking at all this stuff, and we're 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 using my fitness pal. You know, we're saying we're we're tracking how many quant- how many portions of vegetables we're eating per day. We're thinking about eating things like beans to increase our fiber, etc. All these different variables. The average person isn't doing that. Most people aren't doing that. So I think recommendations to lower uh, red meat intake or eat it rarely and displace it in favor of things like leaner meats and salmon, uh, oily fish, etc. I think that on balance, when you look at that stuff at the public health level, it does make a lot of sense, I think. Yeah, and especially when we look at a, a public health level, like obviously the recommendations yeah. changed and if they were an individual level, which also mm-hmm. brings me to the realization that, you know, for Ireland as a nation, we could never be self-sufficient and be vegan at the same time. We just don't have the climate for it. Like whatever about being on continental Europe or whatever, you know, like we just don't have a climate that would allow us to actually be vegan so even just as a, a public health message or like it doesn't make sense for ireland which is actually really interesting when you see people that are suggesting things but they're actually completely dissociated from the reality of the economy and the 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 culture that they are recommending things to like for example uh, it's actually I find it both saddening and hilarious at the same time when people do the you know veganuary you know, when they're like, oh, uh, I'm going to be vegan in January, you know? Um, and I'm like, you realize that like winter is the lowest production point for all of these crops. You know, it's like, you, you can't produce these crops in Ireland at this point. So they all have to be imported. So if you're doing this for like, you know, the environment, I'm like, you are, you are causing more harm than you are causing good, you know? Because we don't have the climate. You know, it would be like Iceland or something trying to be... Uh, 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 a vegan community. It's like they just don't have the climate that would allow that. You know, they they, they 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 couldn't do it. You know, and Ireland couldn't do it. Like we we probably maybe could. You know, but there would have to be so much change that would have to occur to allow that to. Oh, what's the story? <laughs> uh, to, to allow that to actually happen. You know, so uh, we have to we have to keep that stuff uh, in mind when we are actually doing a population based. Uh, recommendation we have to take into account the actual economy the actual culture and the actual sustainability of what we're trying to suggest you know but anyway that's a a complete uh, aside and we only have two more things to just mention which gary already mentioned one of them which is fish intake and you know we should definitely be eating more fish i reckon anyway i think that's going to be something that would be associated with better health for a lot of individuals especially individuals who just don't eat uh 
fish at all you know like gary doesn't eat fish he eats salmon and he's like oh that's good enough like literally he's a child you know whenever you listen to gary and he says oh uh, your children for not eating your uh, fruit and veg like just remember that the chap literally only eats salmon as his fish source he's like i don't like any of the other ones literally they're rotten like childish anyway i'm not a fish we live on an island surrounded by fish right like since our joining of the EU, we've sold, I say sold, we've allowed 290, I believe, billion worth of fish just be fished from our seas. You know, we could literally have the fucking Chad economy if we just regulated that shit and they had to dock in Ireland. Um, but anyway, that's, a, that's another uh, discussion. Um, not for the triage podcast. Not for the triage podcast. Um, um, you know, if we just had an increase in our fish consumption, we could also have an increase in our economy overall. So I think that makes economic sense and health sense, you know? Um, so I would be 100% pro as an island community in terms of eating more fish, you know? Um, however, there are some concerns about fish and one of them is this TMAO. Um, and there's a huge discussion we could have about this. However, we're not going to have the discussion because I ultimately think it's irrelevant. I, from my understanding of the research and from my understanding of the the overall effects of it, I'm like, this is just not a concern. Any negatives associated with this are far outweighed by the positives of eating fish. Would you agree, Gary? Yeah, I, w- I would agree. You know, I'm sorry, my dad's actually just putting on a kettle here. So I apologize if, any, if you can actually hear that in the background. Um, but, uh, but yeah, basically, yeah, fish, I think, is, is something that, like, for me personally, like, I didn't, uh, as you said, I actually didn't eat any fish uh, as a child, although my dad, my mom and dad actually tell me that uh, I used to eat fish when I was a child. I used to eat salmon when I was a kid. But then I basically stopped eating it until I was maybe, I probably didn't have fish until genuinely like two years ago, maybe two, 22, 23. And the reason I started to eat fish was because I was looking at the research and I was like, hey, uh, fish seems to be very healthful. So I was like, salmon looks legit. Let's get stuck into some salmon. So uh, yeah, I, I adjust my palate accordingly and now I like salmon. So yeah, I can move on to, to other fish. But yeah, basically like that, that just shows you that my own actions in the real world followed the this thought process. So I did think that the the research was pretty compelling that fish is healthful. And I think uh, it's, it's overwhelming, you know, regardless of discussions about uh, red meat or meat in general, I think when you look at the, the association between fish and health, I think, yeah, eat more fish, you know, get on those Chad kippers, the fucking absolute Chad of fish. But anyway, um, the final one, this podcast is a mega podcast. Fucking touch on fucking everything here now. Um, the final one is just don't do steroids. Pretty yeah. sure. Like literally, I have yet to see individuals who do steroids and don't have cardiovascular complications. You know, and people always like to say like, oh, it's only the the modern day ones. Uh, you know, the modern day steroid users. It's because of the huge quantities they take or whatever. I'm like. Arnold Schwarzenegger has had like fucking five heart surgeries. <laughs> you know, it's not like just a, a golden era versus modern era thing. It's just like, these just don't seem to be beneficial for heart health, you know? Um, I'm sure, like 100% sure there are ways. You know, we, we discussed it with Broderick on this podcast before, and uh, we probably will discuss it with some other individuals as well on the podcast. There are definitely better, more healthful ways to go about using anabolic steroids and um, but for the vast majority of people probably not something i would recommend if you are concerned about your health because if it was man i would be jacked out of my fucking mind right now if i thought it was absolutely healthy. like there is no doubt in my mind i have no ethical moral whatever quandaries no. with this i would be 400 pounds shredded i'd be on all of the fucking steroids um if it's didn't lead to negative health outcomes. Plus I want to have like 12 kids. So, you know, any potential yeah. possible, you know, reproductive issues that does also turn me off the, the, the whole, the whole shindig. And um, Brian, do you have anything else to say on the, the steroid issue and heart disease? 
Yeah, like, I mean, it, what, just because you, you, you said steroids itself, the only thing I'm going to add is like drugs in general um, is prob- probably not wise from, from a health perspective in general. But, but Pharmaceutical drugs or do you mean recreational drugs? Yeah, I mean, I mean primarily uh, recreational drugs, but in some cases just off-label basic pharmaceuticals, uh, but also alcohol, you know. So, I mean, if you're consuming uh, lots of alcohol, just not a good idea for cardiovascular health, would not recommend. Um, and sa- same goes for for drugs, like obviously smoking is a pretty low barrier of entry. Like obviously most people listening to this, I would hope you know that smoking is probably not a great idea for health, but other things that I think people are like, when go, when they go to like mu- music festivals and stuff, people are pretty happy to take things like uh, cocaine and MDMA, et cetera. Um, a lot of uh, excitatory drugs in a lot of cases um, that are just really not great if you're concerned about your cardiovascular health um, and your neuro and your neurological health in a lot of cases as well. Um, But for the purpose of this podcast, you know, cocaine is something in particular that does lead to a lot of heart attacks in in young people. Uh, It can effectively lead to, like when we were talking about atherosclerosis, we said that you get the buildup of plaque in the arteries that stops um, blood flow. Um, Basically what cocaine can do is lead to vasospasm where the, the artery effectively just spasms, closes in, and then you get a heart attack. Um, along with along with other effects, absolutely. Uh, but basically, yeah, if you're if you're very uh, liberally taking uh, recreational drugs, a lot of the time you're like, hey, you know, I just want to uh, do the have these different experiences, bro. You know, you might just want to uh, check out uh, some of the research on how they impact your health first, um, if that's something you're concerned about. Like, again, you know, yeah, <laughs> there you go. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's obviously it's obviously drug specific, and that's something that's that's worthy of different podcasts. But in general, just if you're going to take something, um, try to at least be mindful of how it might impact your health if it's going to, especially if you're going to do it regularly, because it is one of those things where it's kind of you could almost call it a a black swan event because you could have so many friends and and unfortunately i know people who have have passed away because of this um you could have so many friends who always take these drugs and it's like hey look they're having a great time and this is obviously what your parents tell you as a kid not to take drugs like everyone's having a great time you've never seen any other problem but when there is a problem it can just be death on the spot and you could have been in perfectly good health and unfortunately you're 20 21 years old and that's it done finito um so yeah just just be mindful of that that when you're conceptualizing risk there's actually a difference in conceptualizing risk associated associated with saturated fat which it's where we're talking about chronic increases in ldl and the atherosclerotic process over decades which i think more freedom to kind of think about you know you have some time whereas if you're talking about taking um, a load of cocaine on a night out it could be the case that tonight you die um or it could be the case that you go 1000 nights with no ill effects and that's ultimately up to the individual to to try and weigh up yeah 100 so don't take pingers in nightclubs it's a pretty good idea yep um, and anyway, i have nothing else to to say um no, nope, that's you pretty comprehensive. To round out this this podcast. Anything that you want to just touch on, mention? I think we've we've covered like there is actually more stuff that we could potentially cover, and we could. Oh man, there's so much. <laughs> like we we do eventually plan on having an article series of pretty much everything. You know, like I, I'm talking like small magnitude of effect things, and like yeah, like this one little thing that you know maybe has zero point zero 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 one percent effect. And like I want to have an article that just has everything that you could potentially do because as i said at the start of this like individuals like to just exclude certain things and i would rather have those individuals still looked after you know what i mean like i'd rather be like have an individual who's like oh i just i just don't believe the saturated fat stuff i'm like all right well do all these other things as well you know and um, because i do also believe that there are potential like I was saying, even with the saturated fat, like you maybe can get up to 15% of your intake if you're doing all these other healthful things and you're looking after like the big hitter things, you know, you may potentially even you could get up to higher. We don't know, you know? Um, however, I'd be fairly confident in saying like 10% right now. Um, but if you're doing all these other healthful uh, or heart healthful things, I'm like, you know, maybe you can get away with more uh, deviance in some other areas, you know? So, we want to eventually have an article series on all of the all of the things, and um, but do note that we just didn't cover all of them in this podcast. However, we do cover a lot of things that should be able to give you a good launching point uh, for further uh, investigation yourself, 
um, and provides some sort of reference so that you can go back on and be like, right, we'll go back to this and be like, oh, what did they say about antioxidant supplements? And be like, all right, they, they didn't seem to be too too keen on them. I was reading this article and you know the article author seemed to be fairly keen on the, on these antioxidant supplements. Oh, wait, oh, they, they actually sell antioxidant supplements. Oh, that, that's probably why. And um, so like, I, I want you to have some sort of reference to go back to because it's probably going to be about two years before we write that article series because we have quite a lot of other work to do. And with that in mind, Gary, what other work do we do? Me? I don't do anything. I know you don't do anything, but as a company, what do we do? <laughs> oh, as a company, yeah. Um, so yeah, guys, obviously, if you've been listening to the podcast for any uh, period of time, uh, you'll be aware that we have a newsletter. It's called the Triage Method Newsletter. Um, and you can subscribe to that below um, in the description box, and then you'll receive lots of information that is exclusive to the newsletter and uh, related to things like recommended resources from, from around the internet. So like a lot of the time on the podcast, we say, you know, there's a lot more that could be discussed uh, about this topic or, you know, there's uh, studies related to this topic. That's where you find them. That's where you put them. We put them in the newsletter so that, you know, uh, and one of the things I've been trying to do uh, on a side note, one of the things I've been trying to do recently is think about what we've discussed in the podcast or maybe what we've been writing about and then maybe post a research paper or articles from other businesses on that topic so that you can kind of read more broadly on it um, and obviously we share all of our own articles etc in the newsletter as well so if you don't follow us on social media or you don't keep up then that's where we're going to be posting all of the the content that we have been producing um in addition to that, you can join the Triage Method community. That's our Facebook group. And there's been lots of uh, productive questions and discussions, et cetera, within that group. So I'd recommend joining there. Uh, you can join that below. That's open access again. Um, we do have an upcoming service that's going to be of interest to coaches or those of you who are very interested in starting to apply some of the, the scientific stuff we, we discuss and the theoretical stuff we discuss in like the real world. Uh, that's going to be the coach's corner that'll be launching at probably the end of August. And basically that's going to be focused on training, nutrition, um, and co the practice of coaching itself. Um, like how do you design programs? How do you uh, educate your, your clients on nutrition? Um, where, where, how does anatomy tie in with biomechanics and how does that tie in with exercise selection and how does that tie in with rehab, et cetera. So it's where we're going to be trying to marry a lot of the stuff that we write about and discuss on the podcast in a more coherent manner that's uh, focused on coaches. Um, so yeah, you can pre-register your interest for that in the description box below. Um, and yeah, get involved. You'll get a discount once you pre-register your interest. And other than that, guys, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel. Would recommend. You can follow us on social media. Um, and I think that's most things. We do have online coaching spaces available as well. Um, only a few. Online quite busy. Only a few. Only, online coaching has been picking up uh, quite a bit, which is good since the gym's reopened. Uh, so if you are interested in getting involved, uh, now is the time. 100%. Um, yeah, I have nothing else to add. That was fantastic, Gary. Um, yes, I love everyone. Uh, peace out. It's too easy. Um, Gary doesn't eat fish and he's a child. Patty's a bitch. <laughs>